Hello friends, this is Rosa Shai with another episode review. This is episode six, Kill Process. Yeah, this is this is gonna be a bit of a doozy. Got my peps right here. Trying to keep you on point. This is actually the second time me doing this. The first time the the audio was kind of messed up, couldn't fix it, so. But uh still torn up about this episode. Um I think this is an episode that's gonna pay uh dividends, if you will, of, of what's to come, the direction of maybe the series. I'm not sure we're seeing all of it, but pieces and hints. This is what Sam S. Mill uh, does for this series uh, given us little crumbs if you will that if we pay attention or see something Whether we think it's relevant or not it becomes relevant later on uh, there's really um, No pieces goes unused um, I think that's like Something like people like who build things like they always use like everything they can there's there's a purpose to everything everything you know even scrap gives use for something. Um, you can make something out of pretty much anything and everything. You try to use everything you can. Um, be very economical, if you will. And I think this show does that with uh, its characters, its storytelling, um, the timeline, um, the length of each season, which is like 10, 11, and 10, I think. Uh, the fact that the show is supposed to have five seasons, everything's kind of really like plotted out which um, other series have done so in the past to some success. Um, there are other shows that do like maybe series by series, but not an overall arc. I think like, you know, the most recent one might be like Breaking Bad. Uh, before that would have been um, maybe to some extent Lost, but that was like season to season. And even though they had a series arc, it just didn't really gel or coalesce. So, so not everyone sticks to landing. Um, X-Files had somewhat of a plan or kind of an arc. Uh, Babylon 5 is really like the show that everyone goes to uh, by J. Michael Stagowski. Uh, it was from the 90s. It's a sci-fi show. It's really one of the shows that people go to where he actually plotted out all five seasons beforehand, before getting started. It's kind of like the template where other writers kind of took from that, from everything from like even Josh Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer, um, you know, Lost, um, Twin Peaks, Bates Motel. A lot of great shows, even c comedy shows do this. Uh, the Good Place, which is on right now, I think is very clearly kind of like there's a series arc and there's individual season arcs um, that go on. Um, is one of those shows that does that. That's, you know, maybe not drama, but, you know, kind of has drama as a comedy. Uh, but definitely this show, this, everything's... Everything's blotted out. So let's get into this. Um, got lots of notes on this. So the show starts with a flashback. It starts with a flashback of Angela as a child. And she's at what is called a living funeral. And if you don't know what a living funeral is, it's um, when people uh, know they're dying, typically it's from cancer or some kind of... Um, there's, you know, mostly I, I hear this for cancer, but I'm sure there's other diseases where people um, know that they're dying is fatal. There's nothing that can be done. All the treatment that could be done has been done. They have what these are called living funerals where people come and celebrate their life while they're there and say their goodbyes before the person passes. Um, I don't think it's really a recent phenomenon. Well, kind of recent, at least maybe in the States. I think other cultures have done this in s some sense, but... Uh, it looks like that's what is happening. It's like a a, a party, a wake, if you will. Uh, a lot of, 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 I guess you could say, uh, Angela's mom's uh, friends and family there. Angela's there. Uh, Elliot um, Alderson, uh, Mr. Alderson. I, should, I know, uh, what is Elliot's father? Edward. Edward is there. Um, he um, sees Angela. She's actually watching Back to the Future. Uh, I kind of vaguely recall that cartoon. I, I don't think I personally saw it, but I remember it being on television. I think it was um, not so much Saturday morning cartoons person when it was on, but uh, I did definitely watch like after cartoon, after school cartoons like 
Darkwing Duck and Batman and stuff like that. So I might have missed this one, but I do remember it being on television. I remember what was it? There was a few like cartoon TV shows that were like kind of in the 80s, late 90s, or based off of movies or something like that. Like um, I think like Rambo, which was a weird one if you think about it, was a cartoon. Um, Ghostbusters, I remember the Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters crate. Ewoks, Star Wars, that was a great cartoon. Uh, Droids was a little bit earlier than that, but you know, stuff like that and Back to the Future was one of those. I think it came around the same time as like, maybe like Ghostbusters in that time frame a little bit. But she's watching it. Um, of course, Back to the Future was in the background of um, the series. You know, it's Back to the Future 2 is Elliot's favorite, you know, movie. Uh, I think it's also maybe in, in a sense Angela's favorite movie, maybe because it's Elliot's, but who knows, maybe she loves it for her own purpose and reason. Um, but Edward Alderson sits down with Angela and, and he says, you know, you know, I think Elliot, I've seen this one, I think Elliot has this on VHS, starts talking to her, Angel's asking, is Elliot here? And he's like, you know, um, he's not going to come. She's like, okay. She goes, you know, and he goes, you know, your mom wants, probably wants you to go over there and talk to her. And she's like, I don't want to talk to her. And, um, <laughs> Mr. Alderson, uh, uses a Back to the Future as a way to kind of guide Angel to go over there and talk to her, to her mom. Um, he says, you know, you know, Marty had to convince his, um, father to George to go and ask Elaine out. And if he didn't, you know, Marty wouldn't have been born. And, you know, there's something he had to do. And it's only, only because George was kind of scared. And, you know, it's a scary thing to do. But you kind of, you know, it's something you can do. And I believe in you. And, you know, he also said, I hope that, you know, one day, you know, if, I, when I, if I'm not around, you know, if Elliot needs a bit of a push, you know, that's what George needed for Marty, that maybe you could be there to give him a push. Which <laughs> kind of explains a little bit of um, Angela's relationship to Elliot. She says, you know, she's here here to push him. Um, push Mr. Robot, push Elliot into his revolution, into the direction of the revolution that he wanted. Um, so Angela goes and talks to her mom. We, you hear over here an adult conversation in which the lawyer that uh, Angela will later use and then fire uh, says, you know, the benefactor still wants to pay for the treatments and stuff. And she's like, no, I want to, you know, I, did, I don't want to do the treatments anymore. You know, do you tell, can you tell the anonymous person, you know, thank you, whatever. Um, some people are thinking that the benefactor might in fact be Philip Price. Um, that's something that's been hinted for a while that maybe Philip Price might be Angela's father. Um, he is kind of old. Maybe he's a grandfather. I don't know. Uh, but there's definitely some kind of relationship. Um, you know, he was very upset that White Rose actually even met Angela. Um, he's kind of protective of her, yet he listens to Angela even though she has demonstrated some significant competency in working within the e-corp realm uh, I think he gives her a little bit more deference than he might have given other people that hasn't been properly explained but maybe this is a hint to the fact that maybe he is indeed in fact Angela's father I do like the 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 mother that was cast she has like the big eyes that White Rose talked about about shooting out uh, obviously you know kind of hinting that you know the strong film the film of familiar ties between Angela and her mother and how she's very much like her mother. Um, the same child actress that played the, the child in season two where Angela got questioned by White Rose in that room is the same actress playing a young Angela. I don't know if that means anything. I don't have to, have, is anything to do with the whole time stream multi-universe theory that oh, there's a lot of a grade of people on i'm not a part of it i'm amused by it um if it happens i don't think i'll be upset by that but um it was just a very interesting don't know what that overall means um maybe they just really liked the actress and thought she can play the role or whatever she it looks like she's a little bit older from you know kids grow up pretty fast but angela's talking to her mother and she doesn't want to talk to her mother. She doesn't acknowledge that her mother's dying, leaving them, and stuff like that. And her mother tries to comfort her, saying that, you know, we're going to meet again. You know, this is not the end. We're going to play. We're going to cook. We're going to do things. You know, we're going to see each other again. And this might kind of fill into how White Rose was able to convince Angela to be part of this whole Dark Army plot by 
kind of tapping into this childhood notion that she's kept within herself. And she spoke about to Elliot, you know, I would love to be able to talk to my mother again. And she, you know, when she understands Elliot's illness in the first season, um, and even so, more so on, you know, this season as she's talking and inter interacting and engaging with Mr. Robot, that personality that Elliot has, um, does she think she can bring back, as she tells Elliot, you know, bring back their father and her mother and then undo all of this is like, as if it's not going to happen. I mean, we see this flashback at the beginning of the episode and we kind of start right at the end of the last episode where the one shot episode where you see Elliot confronting Angela like, what the hell have you done? I saw you in the, in the Koki room. What did you do? What did you give them? Why did you help them? And um, there's still dark army guys in the area. They go into Angela's office and Angela's like, you know, this is part of the plan. This is part of the revolution. I made it happen. And he goes, Angela, they're going to kill people. She goes, no, that's, that's not going to happen. Everything's going to be okay. You know, White Rose, and Elliot's like, White Rose is a liar. White Rose is a terrorist. What you did is help them, you know, kill people. And Angela's like, you know, no, you know, everything's going to be okay. No one's going to get hurt. Everything's going to be all right. All this is going to be undone. We're going to see our mother and father again. Everything's going to be okay. And Elliot's like, you're not making any sense. You sound crazy. And she does kind of sound crazy. Because whatever White Rose showed her or told her, what's going to happen, I don't know if some kind of time travel thing or alternate universe where you can bring people back uh, that convince Angela to be part of this. She believes it. And Elliot's like, no, this is all a lie. And he, he, he leaves because she's basically, she rejected him and she basically said, Mr. Alderson, I believe she steps away from him and goes, I mean, I believe Mr. Alderson that you were fired today and you don't have permission to be in this building. And I don't know if that was a trigger to kind of get Mr. Robot to activate or a way to just basically centering herself and being dismissive, being that cold person that she can be towards Elliot and shutting him out because uh, he, she, he is not the person that she's focused on. Mr. Robot is. That's the person she's helping with, really with the revolution, which is really Elliot. And she says it. He goes, this is your plan. This is your revolution. It's you. And she, he, and Elliot was like, no, it's him. She goes, no, but it's you. So kind of confronting him on that. Um, so, let's see here. So, so Elliot notices in the room that the red wheelbarrow bag, and so he knows what Tyra Wellick is. He knows he saw. Uh, Angela with Tyra Wellick. He knows he saw them together, so now he knows the location. Um, the, the bit of hidden knowledge that Mr. Robot has kept from him. So he leaves the building. He's going to go, basically, he needs to get out of terminal, as he keeps saying, to stop the explosion, to stop from the uh, Dark Army from implementing the signing keys. And um, he, he gets a call from Darlene. She's with Dom. And she wants to know where Elliot is. He hasn't been calling her. He's supposed to call her back. And he says, do you know where Tyra Wellick is? And he goes, yes. And he gives the location. So Darlene gives the location to Dom. They overheard the conversation. And it's the Red Wheel Barrel basement. She, he's like, you need to get to him. And Darlene tries to apologize to him, kind of encoded away uh, as Dom is listening. And Dom's looking at her. And she's like, what are you not telling me? So basically, Darlene is kept to the fact that, you know, the Dark Army is trying to blow up this building, blow up. Uh, the recovery building. Uh, she's keeping that hidden from Dom. So, but she doesn't convey that, and she so Dom and her partner leave. And we'll get back to um, Dom and her partner in a moment. But you know, Elliot's panicking. He's frantic. He's trying to think. He's trying to think. You know, what could he do? How he can get on terminal? How can he stop this? And he realizes he has to go to the building where it's going to happen. If he can get inside, then he can get on a terminal and stop it. So he goes there and he sees like all the employees out. He thinks it's great. Yeah, great. And he sees that the fire department's there and they're leaving. And he goes, what are you doing? Why are you leaving? There's, there's going to be a bomb. He goes, there, there's no bomb. We cleared the building. We're going to look at all the floors. Everyone's going get to get back in. Um, this firefighter's telling him. And Elliot's panicking. And he realizes that there's no bomb for them to find because it's gas. It's not a physical, you know, 
instrument. There's no like C4 or barrel or dynamite pipe bombs. There's nothing for them to find. So he knows definitely he has to get into the building, get into a terminal, and somehow figure out how to stop it and maybe get these people out of this building. Because he doesn't want people to die. So he's thinking, he's thinking, he's thinking. He knows his badge doesn't work, so he's going to get in there and he's going to take someone else's badge and he ends up taking a security card's badge, uh, uh, e, oh, you know, employee of the E-Corp badge off of him, just kind of uh, swipes it off of him, swipes in and uses his access to get into the building, get to different places. He gets in, um, he's hunting for a terminal, finds the computer, finds the room first gets there, gets his computer up and running, and he starts getting in, and then he starts glitching. He glitches, and he wakes up, and he's in his taxi cab. And his taxi cab is ridiculously decorated. I kind of love it, and it's probably very New York. I mean, if you think about it, you know, these guys invest a lot of money that if they own their medallion and own their cab, it's their livelihood, so they're probably gonna spruce it up and make themselves unique and different to where people are gonna call upon them to, uh, for their rights. It has like goldfish and all this stuff and Elliot realizes that and he sees the computer screen he sees uh, 15 minutes have passed and the guy's talking to him yeah yeah we have he's naming all those goldfish you know we haven't really had that many lives since you know the five nine hack you know rights not lives uh, it was great to be you to you know choose us and stuff like that you know talking to him and Elliot's like how did how did I get here when ha this happened he goes so just like 20 seconds ago he goes you need to take me back and he goes what and he goes you need to take me back. He gets out of the car, <laughs> runs back to the building, and he realizes that he is fighting Mr. Robot, that he glitched, and he doesn't have the time. He doesn't have the time to fight. He's trying to figure this out. So he gets back to the room he's supposed to be in, and his computer is gone. He's nowhere there, and he's freaking out. He's panicking, and he's like, he can't do this. He can't fight. He's losing time. He doesn't know what to do. So he has to find a terminal. He has to find a terminal to where he can access and get into the system. So he goes to a computer lab, gets into the computer lab, starts typing up the same sequence again, and then he glitches again. And this time he's in an elevator. So he's in the elevator and he's like wondering the time, 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 and he gets back and runs back to the computer room. Well, there's another person in the computer room and looks at him and looks at Elliot the first time, well, suspiciously, probably because he hasn't seen him before, perhaps because he's in the hoodie and not in uh, E Corp gear or whatever, or at least, you know, he's wearing a hoodie and backpack and all that stuff. I don't think he has his backpack now. I think he's just in his hoodie. Uh, so he gets back and he's all panicky, sweating, and he realizes he lost uh, six minutes this time. So he's like, okay, so I gotta, gotta get this. I can't let him do that. And he realizes, how many times has he glitched? Uh, basically, what he's trying to do is he's trying to close the back door, prevent, you know, Dark Army from getting in. Let's see how it, we're, we're just dealing with Elliot. Uh, he glitches again. So he glitches again in the computer lab, and when he he realizes that uh, he's closed out. He he's like, and he lost like four minutes. He's still in the computer lab, so he pulls up a note screen. And he's like, I need to talk to basically Mr. Ro Robot himself, if you will. I need to talk to myself and stop this from um, being whatever it is. You know what's going on, and. <laughs> So Ellis starts typing and asks, you know, says you need to stop this. People are going to get killed. You know, why are you doing this? And then he glitches again. And when he gets out, it, the computer room is torn apart. And he's like, oh, I guess he didn't like my question. The other guy that was in there is freaked out because Ellis literally had thrown desktops and, and screens all over the place, ripped everything out. He starts running out of there. Elliot's panicking because he knows security is going to come to get him. He's trying to figure it out. He's blocked out of stopping what's happening. What is another solution? So he goes, I got to go to the battery room. He looks in the fire extinguisher and he goes, boom. If I take the oxygen out of the room, no spark, no explosion. That's not going to take out the building and kill all these people. So he has to get to the battery room. And as he's running to the battery room, he gets into the stairwell and he trips. So Mr. Robot trips him, you know. And he gets up and he's like, uh, he's like in pain and he keeps going down the stairs and then all of a sudden he starts glitching several times and it looks like he's banged himself against the wall. It's like super freaky and yet at the same time very funny. So he's 
you know, fighting himself and he's going down and getting slammed into walls, slammed into pipes, uh, just constantly glitching, uh, running into walls. It's just like this like kind of Looney Tunes. The only thing missing was like stars and freaking animated uh, birds above his head. And he's like banged up. He's like, he's bleeding, his nose is bleeding, his mouth is bleeding. He's trying to crawl up and stuff. Uh, another person comes through the corridor, looks at him, sees that he bangs his head on a pipe, just looks at him and just keeps walking, which is freaking crazy on my part. He's like, oh, none of my business. And he just yelling, keeps going and going until he finally gets to the security room uh, where the batteries are. And he sees the room and he, and he tries to get into the room but his badge doesn't have access to the room. He's like, come on. And he's like, well, how am I gonna get into the lock? How am I gonna get past this keypad thing? And he sits down at the terminal and he tries to talk to Mr. Robot again. He goes, why are you doing this? You know, this is, um, it's gonna kill a lot of people. This is not what we were supposed to be doing. You don't have to do it this way. You know, you're getting played. None of the paper records are here. So why is this happening? And Mr. Robot is, uh, says, you need to get out of the building <laughs> so we both won't die. And Elliot's like, no, <laughs> I'm not leaving. Um, you know, you're being played. This is, th the paper records aren't here, so why are we blowing up this building? Um, so Mr. Robot is thinking, and you can see him as, you know, Elliot glitches again, thinking about this trying to you know figure out what's really going on here you know are is there no paper records is elliot lying to him he doesn't think elliot you know figure it out and elliot's like basically begging him he's like i need your help so mr robot you know uh he somehow gets into the room uh we don't see how it happens but elliot wakes up he's in the room uh the door's about to close he gets in there you know um he uh you know, he uh, props the door open a little bit. He hits a fire extinguisher, so it, it sucks out the oxygen in the area and prevents the bomb from going out. He basically, with the help of, with the help of Elliot, he basically saved the day. Um, so that's basically, uh, to this point, we're gonna stop here for Elliot's story. So we have, Elliot battling Mr. Rowe, battling himself internally to prevent the explosion of the stage two, you know, the recovery building with all these people in it. Uh, because he pulled the fire extinguisher, that meant that the, everyone, um, the fire alarm, everyone had to evacuate the building again. So there's not just even a chance there's not going to be any people in there. Elliot is able to blend into the crowd and starts leaving, puts his hood up. You know, once again, he has his hero moment. So we get to Dom's storyline. Uh, so Dar Dom gets with her partner, gets the information from Darlene about Tyra Willick's location. Alright, so she gets, I don't even know why I have that up there, I don't know what I'm doing with that. Uh, so she's already for Santiago, says we need to get, this incredible, this is why we have the asset. He's there. We need to go. We need to scoop him up. We might not have this chance in five months. Um, her partner's backing her up. It's like, yeah. And Santiago was like, no. Um, we need to do some surveillance. We need to call HRT. We need to make sure this is the place. He's actually there. We need to make sure it's all credible. And, and she's like, no, we, we need to get this guy. He goes, no, we need, we might have only one chance on this. We might, we need to scoop you know, to scoop to get this guy, we need to basically do everything by the book. And even our partner's looking at San Diego all side-eyed, like, really, by the the book, to the letter, the T? So Tom storms, and he goes, you need to stand down, we need to do this properly, make the phone call, he's gonna make the phone calls, get the SRT out there, get surveillance out there, and see if he's even there. So Tom storms out, her partner goes with her, Santiago, because he's a rat, a rat fink, he's a traitor, uh, pulls out, I guess, his extra phone or whatever, signals, actually using the signal app, Irvin, Irvin's name's on there, 
pipes in saying that the Willock location is burnt. You know what to do. And then he uh, kind of finishes it up. It happens a little bit later. He calls his mom. Tells his mom not to leave the house. His, his mom says she needs some insure. He says, I will make sure that you get some. I'll have it delivered. She's like, <laughs> he, he, you can only hear his side of the comment. Yes, say deliver, mom. And make sure just don't leave the house today. Just whatever you do, don't leave the house today. So, Durham, back at her desk, is, you know, staring over the, going over all the evidence. And she's looking at, I believe she's looking at the uh, F Society evidence uh, from the front house looking at it sees the red barrel red wheelbarrow location screen pop up and she goes to her partner he goes you know lunch he goes you know i can eat yeah i can eat too you know be nice to go eat and he looks at her and he goes you know only if you want to go eat and she goes yeah i, I can get some lunch you want to get some lunch and he's like oh <laughs> so they go and they basically go rogue and they're going to the Red Wheelbarrow location. So the setup for them is this. Uh, her partner's in the the car listening in as she's communicating to him. She goes into the Red Wheelbarrow location, describes all the people in there, how many people in there, like how many employees are in there. She goes up and he goes, do you see Tyrone? Goes, no, but you know, kind of scooping it out. And she says, oh wait, she knows the guy was in a restroom. There was 11, now there's 10. She's looking at the location, she's looking at the place, she goes, I want to eat, she's going to order. Same girl at the desk, she must be getting a lot of hours, this girl. Uh, looking at the place, she goes, and, and Dom asks, you know, how long have you been open? Oh, she's like, oh, we've been open for like six weeks and stuff, but if you're here for the grand opening special, I'm sorry, that's already passed. She goes, no, oh. and so, so Dom orders, gets her food, sits down, you know, they're looking around, Dom's looking around, trying to suss up the place. She's got a feeling about this place. She goes, she goes into the restroom. She's gonna try to get into the back as she's going to the, so she goes to the restroom, hides out a bit, leaves out of the restroom, goes to the back. She's describing her, what she's doing to her partner. And as she's going in there, there's like a smoke coming. And she goes, there's a smoke from coming from the back room. And there's an employee like just weighing it or whatever. And it's kind of brilliant. And we'll get into the, why the smoke is there. And, uh, <clears throat> Her partner goes, there's no back room on the schematics. And she goes, he's here. So she switches the, the um, mic, her mic, and she calls it in saying a possible, there's a, calls it in that there's a fire at the Red Wheel Barrow uh, location, uh, possible Tyrell Well exciting. She calls it in to so get people there. She tells her partner to go out around the back to make sure he's not making a runner. And she goes in. So she opens the door, makes sure it's not hot. You know, she, she's not stupid. Goes down, goes down a set of stairs, sees this basement. There's all this, um, you know, water, like long-term care stuff. Looking around the room, she sees where the smoke is coming from. The, the, the like a trash can's on fire. There's a bed with a handcuff. But she doesn't see anybody down here. And then she notices and she she kind of senses it and there's like a red apron hanging up and she pushes it and it's a it's a tunnel so kind of a little bit later and santiago shows up and there's all this fbi gathering evidence and santiago is like you know this is still a win and she's like tyra well still out there we need to go there yeah but you know you didn't catch him you kind of need to go back i don't appreciate you going rogue on here but this you still win it's obvious who's here there's all this all this here we can go through the evidence which i need you to do basically get given our scut work and she's a little pivot by this but she doesn't really say anything i need to go back to the office go over the evidence and see if we can find him so Dom goes back to the office. Uh, she's actually kind of escorted by a colleague, if you will, back to make sure she goes back to the office. Uh, Santiago's there and he's looking around the place. And I guess she maybe she showed up a little too early for whatever the plan that was. Um, so she gets back to the office. She's with her little escort. She's, there's like a coffee stand thing. She's going to get some coffee. She's outside the building. Um, her colleague goes, I'm going to go up the office and everything, do you need, you know, is anything else you need? She goes, no. And so Dom just is getting some coffee and she's just pissed about the day. 
and we'll stop Dawn right there. So Darlene. Alright, so Darlene is like, she says it, pins and needles, waiting for Dom to call her to see if the Tyrell well lead leads to his rest. She calls Dom. Dom's at the office. You know, she's pissed because she wants to take Tyrell well and follow the lead, but she can't. And Darlene's like, what's going on? What? And Dom's like, what the hell are you calling me for? Uh, you're not telling me everything. I know this. And you're, you're wondering about, you know, <clears throat> Tyra Willick, where's your brother? She goes, I've been trying to call him, but I haven't been able to reach him. Which, given the battle between Elliot and Mr. Willick, understandable, okay? Um, <laughs> so Dom basically hangs up the phone on Darlene. It's like, you need to tell me everything or <laughs> fuck it. Uh, Darlene says, you know what, fuck it. So she gathers her stuff and goes to Angela's. And she's banging on Angela's door. <laughs> And Angela, you know, goes to it and she's not wanting to answer. And she goes, I can see your big guy. You open the door. Angela's like, go away. I don't want to see you. She goes, I know what you've been doing. You need to open the damn door and you do it now. So Angela opens the door. And she goes, I don't even know why you're here, what you're going about. You know, Ellie's here. It goes, I know that. Where's Tyra Well, like, what the hell are you doing? What? You've been manipulating my brother. And Angela's like, you don't know what I'm talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. You don't know what you're talking about. She goes, I know. And Angela's like, look, you're the one who started F Society, okay? You brought me in, you and your brother, you know. All I'm doing is helping them along. And she goes, you guys are blowing up a damn building. And Angela's like, no, that's not, nobody's going to get hurt today. And <laughs> Darlene's just like, ugh, with Angela. And she's like, no, nobody's going to get hurt today. And... So her and and Darlene are getting into it, and then um, their phones go off, and so that ends Darlene's aspect of the storyline. A little bit prior to that, so a little bit about Angela is after um, Elliot left, she eventually left the E Corp building, made it somehow through the riot, uh, gets on the subway system, and. There's like these two old women, they're, they're conversating about the state of their existence, really. One of them's gonna go move in with her daughter, you know, she doesn't wanna live by herself, you know, you know, expenses and things of that nature. And, you know, you kind of, everyone's kind of half listening to the conversation because nothing else is going on. But over the corner is a guy that kind of looks like the Joker, but in the F Society mask, has like the greased hair, blonde, and matted down, and has the F Society mask, and he's just all wired up. And he pulls out a handgun and he's like robbing the, the, the train car that he's in. He's asking all the women, oh, your purses, your wallets, blah, blah, blah. And then he points it at Angela and Angela looks at him and he goes, give me your wallet. And she goes, no. <laughs> and he's like just staring at her and kind of emphasizing the gun. He goes, give me your wallet. And she's like, no, nobody's going to die today. And the guy's just staring at her. And I guess they're about to, the train's about to slow down, so he just exits instead of killing her. And the, the old women are like, you know, like crazy, just give him your wallet, you know, it's not worth it. And he leaves, and they're like staring at her all crazy, and it's just it's very nonplussed, you know, nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna get her today. And that eventually leads her being at the apartment, and, um, you know, her confrontation with Darlene. So it's pretty much the end of Angela's storyline. Uh, let's see. So, Tyra Wellick. So, so Tyra Wellick is in the basement of the Red Wheel Barrel restaurant. And he sees, you know, Irvin's there and he's like, you know, confronting Irvin. He goes, why? Why are they here? Why are they taking this stuff? We need to monitor the attack. We need to make sure things are going the going the way. They're kind of exiting at the same tunnel that Tyrell Willett goes in. He, and Tyrell's like, yeah, um, <laughs> it's not going to go like that. And then Tyrell like, starts panicking. And he goes, you know, I was following with my wife and kids. What's going on here? And everyone goes, I hear something I got to tell you. And so he reaches in his pocket Irvin and Tyrell like panicking thinking that this is how the he's like this is how the dark army repays me without me there wouldn't have been stage two I was the one who found the solution he's like screaming this and starts begging and then 
Irvin hands him a piece of white note, white note and he says you can follow the instructions. And so Irvin leaves and Tyrell turns around and goes, so you're not going to kill me? And Irvin just kind of looks at him, kind of very sympathetic really, like kind of like a sad, aw, puppy look. And he goes, um, sorry. <laughs> and walks away. So Irvin leaves him and so Tyrell, he goes to the little makeshift bed that he has. He cuffs himself to the to the bed. He's drinking some vodka and he's reading the instructions and he lights uh, some paper and he lights it in the basket and there's a bunch of that's where the bunch of smoke that Dom sees uh, and eventually leads her down into the basement for the red wheelbarrow. Now Tyrell he uh, escapes through the escape tunnel and as he escapes he starts um, we'll get back to that. No, actually, we'll go to it. Uh, he starts shouting, you know, it needs to stop, it needs to stop. Now, he's basically in front of the, I guess, what is it, the FBI building? Some people are saying state trooper, I think it's the FBI building. And um, Dom's out there getting coffee, hears this commotion. There's all these federal agents around the area. There are the cops are, it's Tyra Willick, it's Tyra Willick. And Tom looks and looks and sees and she drops her coffee, starts running towards him. He gets surrounded and circled by officers are telling him to go down and go down. And he's shouting, you need to stop the attack. You need to stop the attack. You need to stop the attack. Dom gets there and she goes like, what attack? And that ends Dom's storyline and that ends Tyra Willick. He's getting arrested. He's been captured by the authorities and pretty much by Dom is gonna be like, I don't know, the arresting officer there. And so what attack, um, you know, last we left Elliot, you know, he stopped it. He and Mr. Robot stopped the attack. They are, you know, all these storylines kind of end, kind of like they're cutting forth at the exact moment and we're kind of ending with Elliot here. And Elliot's going down the street. He's, you know, he's like, you know, he, he's grateful. He and Mr. Robot were able to stop this. Uh, prevent Dark Army from blowing up a building. This is not the way to do things. Maybe things can get turned around. Maybe they can figure things out. Maybe they can actually live together, work together. You know, they actually did it. It's not things are not so bad. And as Elliot's walking, he's observing the people. And like, do they know something I don't? They're like at their phones. They're crying. He's like wondering what's going on as he keeps walking. And he's like very confused. Like. Do they know something that he doesn't? And then he sees a gathering people and they're outside like an electronics store. And in front of the electronics store is television screens. And Elliot looks at it and his, his the sound, you know, it was kind of muted and a little down and then again, it it's really loud and you can hear as he staring, as we the audience see, 71 buildings, T Corp buildings were blown up in simultaneous attacks. Uh, the death toll could be in the thousands. We don't know right now. Um, President Barack Obama is going to address the nation. Um, this is the worst crisis that's happened since 9-11. And that's the end of the episode. I did my live reaction to that, and I'm still... Yeah, of course you fall. I'm still aghast by what happened. Um... <laughs> I mean, Seichu went off. Uh, e Corp is down. Um, all those paper records gone. The the Fight Club moment that everyone expected, you know, done with. And the, and then there's two things that the time times went on my head. It was like. Oh my god, what the fuck? Where the hell did that come from? Oh my god, we had no idea, none of what the hell was going on. And, and at the same time, it's like, but this is what we wanted. We wanted this as an audience. We wanted this to happen. But it wasn't a building. It was everywhere.
you know, the revolution, if you will. And I have to hats off to Sam Esmail and the entire cast. I mean, we were so focused on saving the recovery building and stopping it. That was the story that, that we really didn't realize the broader picture and what what really was going on the whole time. And there were clues along the way. Um, you know, uh, very, very beginning, I touched on this live, uh, live reaction, but I'm going to touch on it again. In the first season, when they were going after Steel Mountain, one of the avenues to go through, because initially they were going to, Mr. Robot wanted to blow a gas company to take down, a uh, gas pipeline to take down Steel Mountain. And Elliot found a different way where he using a Raspberry Pi and the thermostat and through Mulby, they realized that the thermostat um, basically was a vulnerability they just had to get in, but it was the same ac access point everywhere so they can use the same vulnerability at other data centers, one being in China. So once they, you know, tagged with the Raspberry Pi, got in and had access, gone were the, the backup data tapes. But the thing was, is that Tyra Wellick was going to migrate that information and um, put it in different areas and, you know, spread it out. Instead of a central, central point of failure, there was going to be some redundancies and there you can't attack, I guess, what, seven buildings at the same time. What this attack do has done is by demonstrating about, you, about that thermostat, how it was like the same system everywhere those US, USP batteries are the same batteries that E-Corp installs in all their facilities, so they all have the same vulnerability. So you can use the same point of attack at all those locations at once. Instead of having you know a central location, those redundancies, you're able to do the same trick, but everywhere. And um, also the fact that, you know, they always talked about the 71 facilities and the paper records. So we always had that number of 71 in our head. We seen the map. We saw in legacy of the map up in the air again, up in the warehouse where Elliot and, uh, Mr. Robot were supposed to be working out initially near stage two, which I guess was probably close to or above uh, the Red Rail Barrel place <laughs> instead of in the basement. Um, yeah, uh, so there were clues there, and someone actually did get it. Uh, it's on Pirate Satellite. Let me make sure. That's the name of his website. Um, I have shared his, um, insights before, um, in the Facebook group. Uh, he always has great breakdowns of the technical aspects, but other stuff, you know, he does a lot of commentary about tech stuff, but other TV shows as well. He's always had great insights about Mr. Rob Mr. Robot, but pretty much from the beginning, but he spoke about it, uh, and I'll have links to the Reddit post, but also his original post on Medium and his site, and he also has a Patreon, so, um, I encourage you to, uh, support him if you like, read his stuff, but he said, you know, I have this thought that we're so focused on, you know, basically stage this one recovery building that we're forgetting about the 71 buildings and I think maybe that's the real stage two. That's the real attack. And he called it like two or three weeks ago. He goes, I could be completely wrong. It's just a theory, but I just think they keep showing us the map and the 71 buildings and I think that's important. And they don't do nothing on this show. Like I said, it's nothing is wasted on this show. Everything is used, uh, is wasted. And he, he's pretty much the only person who called it. Um, I didn't think anyone called it. I didn't see anything. I didn't see his post. I normally see some of his stuff. I ha I didn't see it. And upon reading it, um, the Reddit post, as well as the uh, his, his analysis, uh, his original comment, and then his article, I'm like, oh, yeah. That, wow. I mean, and, and all the clues were there. Like, if you follow the train of thought and follow what he was saying, um, and some other people have been able to backfill in it about, like, um, Tara Wellett talked about when he was making the speech to BCTO, try to, you know, convince Philip Price, he talked about the 71 vulnerabilities. You know, that number was out there. The vulnerabilities, the concept of the vulnerabilities is out there, and that's something that Tara Wellett, you know, conceived. He already had the idea within his head. That's why stage two, which I may, might think might have been the real stage two, and this, this recovery building was a... The distraction that Angela talked about 
Um, but then again, Elliot was messing with the paper records to a, to a point, and they had to go to something different. So, I'm not really sure about that, but it's very clear that the Dark Army and White Rose are playing on a completely different level than everybody else. And to be perfectly honest, Elliot, Mr. Robot, one and the same, fucked up. Um, Angela fucked up. There's 4,000 people dead. There, There's more consequences. 4,000, 3,000, 2,000. There's 71 buildings, so... Uh, 5,000, 10,000. I mean... You, who knows and you know the recovery of people that may be stuck in the building uh, the aftermath of all that the people that may have been injured uh, critical conditions who survives the ricochets the lives of people that have been devastated losing loved ones fathers mothers husbands sisters daughters all that not to mention you know much like 9-11 the toxic waste of these uh, of these buildings explosions in this area all that debris and crap in the area and the recovery work of um, the hospitals and all the, the infrastructure being strained um, the panic I think that's gonna be in the streets I mean I'm, there's gotta be a riot at some point I mean a real honest riot there's you know a terrorist attack so there might be a little bit of calm people are like okay who will we go war with but the economy is just in shambles it really honestly is in shambles and now it's may have been de dealt a death blow and you know E Corp positioned itself or at least in the universe as being like the sole financial provider of the world really and primarily the states you know and so now everything is out there even with their, their I don't even know how the E Corp thing can can continue forward with the backing of you know E Corp uh, it's gone um, what what's that going to do? Um, the devastation of all that, the economic unraveling that's going to occur. So there's a lot of consequences to that beyond just the death and stuff. And, and there's going to be a lot of reverberations and side stuff that you just can't predict. You just can't predict. The, director, the directory of this show has shifted and changed. Stage shoot has happened and it's a very devastating. We're thinking one building all the paper records people get out evacuation plan <laughs> yeah uh, none of that happened um something completely different and what does that you show i've already stated this before in previous shows you know there are no good guys on this show you know our our protagonist is not even really an anti-hero i mean he's killed people he wants to kill people even if it's a different personality and now he has mass murder um, he's already wrecked the economy and the ricochets of that. We've seen that with the, the collapse of 2008. You know, the suicides and um, crime rate and murder and stuff like that from um, the ricocheted out from, from that. So God knows what's going on during the 5-9 hack economic collapse. And now you have this a terrorist attack on top of that. Whew. And... Big balls as him as Mel to pull something out like this off and make it believable and make it not something that's such a curve that it shatters the universe. It's like it's very believable. It's, there's enough clues built in to where if you go back in view and you're like, oh, oh, I I got this distracted by the magician. I should have been paying attention to this other hand over here or what was under the hat. So, shout outs. Um, next episode you know it's going to be about Mulvey and Trenton and oh I hope they survive I hope something good or positive uh I don't know Leon's gonna show up so maybe something good is gonna happen I you know um Joey Badass is a great character who knows where the show's going on from here I mean Christ uh yeah like what it's episode seven Frederick and Tanya, episode eight, nine, so four more episodes, plus two more seasons. The repercussions of this is gonna echo throughout the rest of, so I, I have no idea where they're taking us. I don't, no idea. Um, really enjoying the journey. I, I don't know how they go from here, it was, even with the return of Trenton and Moby, you know, were they in those buildings? Um, were they part of the recovery? Well, they weren't, so there were fries, you know, who knows, you know. Um, 
What part do they still have to play? What is Elliot going to do about the Dark Army? Um, what is he going to do about Mr. Robot? <laughs> what about Darlene? I mean, she didn't tell Dom about the one bombing, and now there's 71. What does that do to our immunity? And especially now that you know we know Santiago is a um, he's a Dark Army person. You know, what does that do? Are they are Elliot and Darlene and Angel going to get blamed for all this? Are, are they going to get locked up? Are they going to go on the run? I mean, I don't see. Yeah, so that if Tyrell is in custody, so, oh, and what is he going to do when he finds out his wife is dead? You know, uh, does he even know his wife is alive? Was that in the note card? I mean, just, so I guess we get those answers at some point, but again, great to the show, great props to the writing and the direction of the show and the acting. Uh, definitely need some Emmy noms, especially the last, I would say, three episodes. Three, yeah, I would say the last three episodes, the visuals and the cinematography and the, the writing and just the acting, just top notch, especially the transition between the glitches between Rami Esquil and, and Christian Slater have, have been great. Um, so we'll see. Um, but that's it for now. That's my review. I thank you all for listening. Um, as your moderator, Rosa Shai, I'm logging off. And until next time, friends.